This evening, we're going to do something we've not done elsewhere in our series. We're going to look at one of Shakespeare's characters in detail. Shylock is one of Shakespeare's most famous parts, and today, The Merchant of Venice is perhaps the play that's most argued about. Some people, of course, feel it's deeply anti-Semitic and ought not to be performed. Others react the other way and say that if you read the text to write, Shylock the Jew is intended by Shakespeare to be sympathetic and even a heroic character, and it's often played that way, so you can take your choice. Patrick and David and I have done the play together at different times, though neither of them has seen each other play the part. So we should all declare at the outset what we believe Shakespeare means us to feel about the character. Well, what we believe is that he shows Shylock as a bad Jew and a bad human being but that this in itself does not make the play anti-Semitic. If we thought it was, we certainly wouldn't do it. Anti-Semitism is certainly expressed in the play by some of the characters, but of course that doesn't mean that Shakespeare himself approves of what they're saying. There are two other Jews in the play, Shylock's daughter Jessica and Tubal, and Shakespeare does not take an anti-Semitic view of them. But Shylock is a would-be murderer who refuses to show Antonio, the merchant, and his intended victim any mercy. Those who try to justify Shylock have to work very hard to get round that, though they usually feel that they can do so. It's interesting that in Israel, most Jews don't seem to have such scruples. There have been quite a number of productions of the play there since the war. The problem with the part, I think, really springs from Shakespeare himself because he very rarely expresses his own views explicitly in a play. He shows us here a bad Jew and some bad Christians, and yet he doesn't articulate his view of the characters. He lets them betray themselves by their words and actions. That is Shakespeare's way. He rarely makes his characters all black any more than he makes them all white. Yet different critics or actors are apt to pick out the black bits or the white bits only, and to interpret the play accordingly. It's even been said that there are only two ways of playing Shylock, either as a goody or a baddie. <clears throat> but if we are to read Shakespeare truly, we must look for the delicate ambiguities and inconsistencies that he provides, as we've seen elsewhere. These inconsistencies are the character, flawed, contradictory, human. If I had to say to an actor one thing only about a part, I think I'd choose to say, look for the ambiguities and the contradictions and play them. So, David, let's first of all get out of the way the question of the anti-Semitism. Yes, well, being Jewish myself, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get it out of the way because I, I remember when I was coming up to actually perform the role, uh, I'd get letters from America, uh, telling me or questioning even the, the, the very fact that I was doing the role in the first place. How dare I do Shylock, you know? And I think that we all have to be very, very careful not just to respond to the play in relation to the 20th century Holocaust. Yes. Patrick, what do you think? Yeah, I, perhaps for the first time, uh, the last time in this programme, I find myself totally in agreement with David. Um, the... Uh, anti-Semitism, the alleged anti-Semitism of the play, because we agree it is not an anti-Semitic play, it has anti-Semitic elements, is a distraction. <clears throat> but I also believe that the Jewishness, which is so often emphasized in The Merchant, is equally a distraction. David's right. For us in the second half of the 20th century, the anti-Semitic expressions in the play are going to reverberate very powerfully. And the director and the 
actor won't need to emphasize them. The reverberation will be present anyway, but you cannot avoid them and you can't underplay them. I think, however, to concentrate on Jewishness um, is, uh, is to avoid the great potential in the character, which is his universality. I think that whenever I've seen a very ethnic, a very Jewish Shylock, I felt that something has been missing, that something has been lost uh, from the performance. Shylock is essentially an alien, an outsider. I think if you see him as a Jew, first and foremost, then he's in danger of becoming only a symbol. I think that Shylock is an outsider who happens to be a Jew. Would you challenge that? Yes, I would. Um, only insofar as that I would interpret Shylock, uh, I'm an outsider, not who happens to be a Jew, but because I'm a Jew. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, the Jewish element in the play, I think, is, is unavoidably very important. I think this is probably where, 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 we, where we differ, in, probably in our interpretations. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what, what your Shylock is like. Um, because I, in, in each of the scenes, and they're not that many, well, in three of the scenes, I mean, Shakespeare does manage to ring a wonderful change in the way that Shylock, uh, the Jew, ha has a business relationship, a family relationship, um, uh, how he responds to his enemies, how he responds to his friends, and also how he, the law, he demonstrates the laws of the land in which he lives. And I think also one, Shakespeare never forget, never lets us, the audience, or the character forget uh, the Jewish thing. Uh, one only has to look at the trial scene to realize that Shylock's name, even having been asked, Shylock is your name, Shylock is my name, that he's only actually called by his name Shylock six times, Jew, 22. Okay, well now let's dig into the part. We're beginning to find already what we find everywhere with Shakespeare, that there's an infinite <coughs> number of interpretations each actor coming to play the part has to start afresh. So where does he start? He'll probably begin by reacting against previous interpretations. And his starting point, I suppose for most actors, is the crucial question, what did he look like? How did he talk? I should state here that uh, when the part was originally offered to me, my inclination was to refuse it for one principal reason, which was that it seemed to me that the part was eternally stuck um, in a, a kind of tradition, a ritual about the role, that if I were to play <clears throat> Shylock, then it would necessarily mean <clears throat> ringlets, a hook nose, <laughs> uh, long, <clears throat> exotic, perhaps semi-oriental gowns, either shabby or uh, decorative to taste, um, that, that there was so much uh, traditional appearance and traditional behavior attached to the role that I could never free myself from it. I could never find uh, a human being at the heart of that uh, exterior, that so. set exterior. So, um, well, as I began to read the play, of course, uh, uh, something else began to appear, something else began to unfold about the character, and I found that indeed there was a highly complex uh, and very modern creation. I decided, therefore, that I would avoid the easily recognizable symbolic uh, elements of Jewishness, the ringlets, the gown, and the, the nose, and so on, although I should say that I had a very large bushy beard and a lot of long, dirty, tangly hair. And I wore a, a shabby, dirty, broken-down frock coat because I think that uh, the most important thing for Shylock in the play is money, possessions, and finance. <clears throat> Having it, therefore, you're not going to waste it on how you appear, so I made an attempt to make my Shylock very shabby and down at heel. As for the voice, one thing influenced me. Shylock is living in a, a strange culture, an alien culture. I think that in order to survive, it's necessary, one of the ways of surviving in an alien culture is to, to assimilate yourself into it. Therefore, <coughs> I gave him an accent which was more cultured, more native than the natives. So I gave him a, a cultured, over-cultured, and over-refined accent, much more so than the aristocrats in the play. You see, I think that the foreignness in Shylock, uh, that which is truly strange and exotic, lies in the language, not in how he appears. No one in The Merchant of Venice speaks like Shylock, not even his fellow Jew, Tubal. 
If you take, for instance, the Laban speech, there is so much rich and curious, bizarre use of language in that speech that that alone says foreigner. Right. So, David, what about you? I chose um, everything in, in opposition to that. I also discovered, as you did in the language, there is a, 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 a certain rhythm to the language, which I um, went with to the extent of even going further with the lilt and slight um, accent. I didn't place the accent in any particular area at all, but I wanted to make it foreign with the language that was foreign, because I felt that was important. I um, never wanted anybody to forget or that I was an outsider or from that point of view. And it's something that I felt Shylock would not have tried to alter, because I'm, my Shylock is very proud of his Jewishness. And why hide it? Exploit it where necessary, if necessary. Uh, which I think he does in the first scene. Isn't that, isn't that dangerous, exploiting it? Isn't that... No, I don't think so, because I think... I, I th well, I think it's hum that human behaviour. But I think also my, my, my dress, if I can just say, um, was smart, um, because, uh, yes, motivation, money, absolutely agree. But uh, with those that he deals with, he asks what news on the Rialto, the stock exchange, banking, money, I think that he would dress according to uh, the status that he believes he has. Sure. Yes. Yes. As director of the play each time, I found both those images totally acceptable, totally consistent <clears throat> with the text. There's never one answer. One always keeps feeling that. I was as totally convinced by the one as by the other. But we've gone through the preliminaries. We should start to dig into the play itself. So what about this famous part that's only got five scenes? Mm. The, scenes are, the scenes are all different. D did you find that? Yes, every that each scene, scene has its own characteristic. Yes. I, I found one uh, dominant motivation, one dominant objective for the whole play, mm. which I've already stated, was that of money, mm. finance, and possessions. And just to briefly come back to the Jewish question again, um, whenever Shylock is given a choice between race and religion or uh, financial security, commerce, business, he always makes the commercial choice. There are there are uh, scores of, I hate him for he's a Christian, but more for that in low simplicity he lends out money yeah. gratis. Yeah. Uh, he has disgraced me, yes, he's disgraced his Jewishness, and hindered me half a million. Always it is the commercial which comes second. Why, there, 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 he says when his daughter has been taken away from him. A diamond gone. Not a daughter gone, but mm. a diamond gone. Uh, so that was, that was the dominant motivation. But, but allowing for that, that being the driving element of the play, then I think it's necessary to isolate the quality and the motivation in each scene. Yes, I, w when, when studying the part, it, it, it's always a terrifying thing with anything like Shylock or those roles because of the history of how it's been played, as you say, mostly black or, or white. Um, and I suppose what uh, I was desperate to try and do was to look at that play without preconception and to look at each scene for exactly what it was, for what it said to me, uh, and to play that, and to play the, um, the sometimes the, the inconsistencies of each, and just to see what, what happened if I just play, went with the scene without overlaying uh, something that I had worked out before. Yes. Right. Terrific. Well, and and with, with the belief that if you play all of the inconsistencies, when the final inconsistency is slotted into place, like a, like a piece in a jigsaw puzzle, then you will no longer have an inconsistency, but a complete, complete and wonderfully yes. colourful and complex right. whole. So right. it's as though little doors open throughout. Terrific. Terrific. Instead of getting all the consistencies, putting them in a pot, stirring them that's up, right. making a blend of them that's and playing right. the blend from the beginning that's of the play right. to the end. Well, that's time. Blast the cannon. Well, I don't know where to go. We must have a look now at it scene from scene, right. otherwise we'll, <laughs> we'll be doing too much talking about it rather than doing it, which is the advice we always give ourselves. Scene one. So scene one on the Rialto. Yes and Shylock meets the merchant Antonio. Yeah. Let's have a go at it both ways. And one of you do your Shylock, and the other do Antonio, mm. and then we reverse it and see how the differences work out. Okay, the Rialto. Okay, uh, uh, we brought with us a number of props. This is one of them. Who's to wear it first? Oh, 
Oh, right You've right. got it. You do oh, show. Right, right. Right. I was going to touch that. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then. You, you come to me and you say, um, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so. You that did void your room upon my beard and foot me as you spur a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is yours. You <laughs> what should I say to you? Should I not say have a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend 3,000 ducats? Or should I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this? Oh, fair sir, uh, you spat on me on Wednesday last. You spurned me such a day. Another time you called me dog. And for these courtesies, I'll lend you thus much monies. Okay, good. His. Change hat. Change hats. <clears throat> I put on my overcoat. Mm. Overcoat and stick. Overcoat and stick. Yeah. Makes me feel old. Right. <clears throat> Signor Antonio, many a time and oft in the Rialto, you have rated me about my monies and my usances. Uh, still have I borne it with a patient shrug, for sufferance is the badge of all our tribe. You call me misbeliever, cutthroat, dog, and spit upon my Jewish gabardine, and all for use of that which is mine own. Well then, it now appears you need my help. Go to then, you come to me and you say, Shylock, we would have monies. You say so, you, to devoid your room upon my beard and foot me as you spurn a stranger cur over your threshold. Monies is your suit. What should I say to you? Should I not say? Hath a dog money? Is it possible a cur can lend, what, 3,000? Ducats, or oh, shall I bend low and in a bondman's key with bated breath and whispering humbleness say this, fair sir, you spat upon me Wednesday last, you spurned me such a day, another time you called me dog, and for these courtesies I'll lend you thus much monies. Good. Well, <laughs> I think that initial setting up scene shows the differences very clearly. Let's... Let's just move on now, and perhaps not do, but talk a bit about the next scene in Shylock's house, and Shylock with his daughter Jessica. What yes. about that? I have to confess now that uh, this, whenever this scene uh, ended, I always felt that uh, the substance of the play was over for me. It was, <laughs> it was for me... Why are you laughing? No, it's it, right. it was God. It was for me that, that gave me consistently the greatest satisfaction in the play. Uh, it differs in one important way from every other scene in the play. It is the only private scene. It is the only non-public scene in the play. Shylock is not on show. For me, the fact that in the other four scenes he was uh, in the public eye meant that he was always under pressure to perform in some way, to appear in, as some kind of personality. He's a... He's an actor, isn't he, Shylock? In this scene, it is not necessary. It is home to the one place where acting and performance, apart from being unnecessary, cannot be accepted. So uh, it was, for me, the scene in which I wanted to show the real man, the true man that lay underneath these uh, wonderful multicolored disguises. And the man that I wanted to show was a man deeply unhappy, embittered, a man uh, from whose life love had been removed, and therefore Jessica was a creature who could give him no love, nor could he return it. I found it a harsh, bitter, unhappy scene, and uh, lay at the very heart of the part for me. 
And uh, it, it was always a sad moment when we left it. Yes, I was, I was always so relieved when I left it. I, 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 every time I got to this scene, both in rehearsal and performance, I, oh dear, I never found it. I never found the right way, well, for me, the right way to play the scene. Absolutely right. Um, Shylock is on his own. And also right that in the text there's almost, I remember you pointing out to me, uh, hardly any word of endearment to the daughter. Uh, my main concern was that, um, being such a short scene, the only scene that he's with his daughter, as you say, he's replaced his wife. Yeah. Um, and I was desperate to give... Um, Jessica, the necessary reasons for doing what she did. Mm. Uh, she does do, she takes an enormous amount of money. One's talking in terms of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of pounds. Um, she does uh, most of his business. Um, and my, my aim was to make her feel smothered as, uh, uh, and to make her feel claustrophobic yeah. by his over-possessiveness. Uh, and by doing that, I had problems because uh, very often I found I had to bend the lines to let me do it. And I didn't quite find it. I, I'm, if I ever do Shylock again, it'll be to get that scene right. Uh, but I, I didn't get it right and it was a problem for me. Well, what about the daughter? What did you feel about Jessica? How much do you care? To care, how much to care for her? Yeah. The, the caring is enormous, but... Uh, uh, so much has, because of his concentration on survival, so much has been killed in Shylock. The real, natural, warm, human, affectionate, loving responses have been cauterized in the man. Mm. And she is a victim of it. And therefore, it is impossible to show the undoubted, unquestioned love that lies there. But it's, uh, it's so far down, it can never be tapped. In our production, remember, we had a controversial moment. I hit her. I struck her very hard. Did you? And mm. after the blow, made some attempt for a reconciliation. Perhaps I will return immediately. But by then, the damage is done, and of course, she will reject it. But really, behind that's the point you made about the commercial mind of Shylock, because in the end, the money matters to him more than his oh, daughter yes. when oh, we go yes. on to the scene in the mm. reality. Yes. Mm. So the, the love is not as deep as that money love. Yeah. Why, don't we, why don't we have a go at a bit of the Rialto now? Shall we set ourselves up the Rialto <coughs> yes, at the, the third scene? Mm. Yeah. Under the table. Yes. Yeah. All right, should we go first? Now, what should we do with the um, first time? Well, what are we actually which, doing now? Which bit what are we going like? to do? Well, I... Shall we look at the long speech? to Solerio and Solanio, yes. because that's a difficult point in interpretation. It's one of the most famous bits in the text, hath not a Jew eyes, etc. Should we not do that? Good. OK. Yes. Right. Will you be the other salad? I would be delighted to be one of them. Yes. Here we are. So we go... Go from, I'm sure, if you will not... I'm sure, yes. I'm sure if he forfeit, that will not take his flesh. What's that good for? To bait fish with all. <laughs> it will feed nothing else. It will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million. Laughed at my losses, mocked at my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, called my friends, hated mine enemies, and what's his reason? I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. Come with me. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? 
If we are like you in the rest, we shall resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Ah, revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be? By Christian example. Why? Revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. Right. All right. <clears throat> All change. All change. <laughs> change come out this right. side. Yeah. Why, I'm sure if he forfeit, that will not take his flesh. What's that good for? To bait fish with all. If it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. He hath disgraced me and hindered me half a million. Laughed at my losses, mocked my gains, scorned my nation, thwarted my bargains, cooled my friends, heated my enemies, and what's his reason? I'm a Jew. I've got a Jew eyes. I've got a Jew hands. Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction. Great. <laughs> I think that the interesting thing there was actually at heart and bottom, both of them were alike underneath the surface difference because they both did something which we all worked on together, which is not usually done with that speech. It's usually done, isn't it, as an appeal for pathos, hath not a Jew eyes, I am strangely moved, I am a poor wronged fellow. And if you do that, you tip the balance of the play in terms of its sympathies, and it's within that speech, that if you do go for pathos and sentimentalize it, that the seeds of playing the all-white Shylock mm -hmm. comes out. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me was that though you were wildly different, <laughs> at heart that was the same, and yeah. I think we're all agreed on. Yeah. It I, was, yeah. it was uh, for weeks in rehearsal, uh, a black hole for me, uh, a stumbling block. I couldn't cope with the speech because I was seeing it, this is again the tradition of the role, mm. uh, and act is acting Shakespeare, it's constantly present. We are, we are bombarded by received impressions, performances we have seen, reviews that we have read. It's mm. so difficult to rid yourself of those impressions and go for something which is original. And therefore, I believe that this was a great speech about humanity, a speech, a plea for compassion, for understanding, for racial tolerance, and I was lucky to make a discovery that um, the speech, in fact, is none of those things, but is a calculating, cold-blooded justification of revenge, the complete opposite of its uh, conventional uh, interpretation. Yeah. yeah, I think the big, the big trap, as you say, is the, um, the, um, the uh, sympathetic trap. Um, I, 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 once again, was terrified by this purple passage. Yes. Uh, oh, God, I mean... They are terrifying, those speeches. And my way into it was the, um, having heard from Solerio Solano his behavior with the Duke on hearing about his daughter, which one never really ever sees, but having come down from that, what is that man's state now? Having been ranting and raving, knocking at the door, saying, get out of bed, find my daughter, find my daughter. Right, he's, he's now off that, he's off that, but these two people here, uh, they taunt him, they mock him, and suddenly the, this deep anger vents itself. And I thought that was my, my, my way into it. 
Uh, you tell me, can I ask a question? Uh, what was the physical state? Do you feel a sense of exhaustion at the beginning of the scene? Because Shakespeare's done a wonderful thing. He describes Shylock at, at the height of his passion off stage. Yes, exactly. We never see it. It's all reported by someone else. Yes. So the man that you see is someone who, as you say, has been over that hill and yes. is now down the other side. Yes, I'm on my Therefore, way. I'm on my way. Finished. I'm, I'm, so, I'm, that's finished. So this, in, in fact, the scene is over before I come in. It's only they start right. doing so. If they didn't speak, yes. I'd go right off the other side of the stage. I think we've got to go on a bit more with this scene because the latter part of this scene involves the decision when does Shylock decide that he's going to claim his pound of flesh? When's he going to decide that he's going to get Antonia? Now, usually, the decision is made quite early on in this scene, or made even in the speech that you've just heard. But we worked for keeping it later and later and later in the scene. And what I want you to watch now is how each of them comes to that decision it's in the dialogue with Shylock's fellow Jew, Tubal, a rich, even more successful, perhaps, Jew than he is. So which of you is going to do it first, eh? Me. It's my turn. We're just organising our crops. We're just organising our crops. Well, here's your little hand. Thank you. <clears throat> how, how now? Tubal. Uh, what news from Genoa? Hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, but cannot find her. Why? There? There, there, there. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell upon our nation till now. Oh. I never felt it till now. 2,000 ducats in that and other precious, precious jewels. I would my daughter were dead at my foot. And the jewels in her ear. I would she were hearsed at my foot and the ducats in her coffin. No news of them. Why so? And I know not what's spent in the search. Oh, why thou lots upon loss? The thief gone with so much and so much to find a thief. And no satisfaction, no revenge, nor no ill luck stirring, but what lights on my shoulders, no sighs, but of my breathing, no tears, but of my shedding. Yes, other men have ill luck too. Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What? 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 Ill luck? Ill luck? Hath an Argosy cast away coming from Trippers? I thank God. I thank God! Good news! Good news! Heard in Genoa. Your daughter spent in Genoa, as I heard, one night, four score ducats. Ah! Who sticks a dagger in me? I shall never see my gold again. Four score ducats at a city. Four score ducats. Well, there came divers of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice that swear he cannot choose but break. I'm glad of it. I'll plague him. I'll torture him. I'm glad of it. One of them showed me a ring that he had of your daughter for a monkey. Huh. Out of honour. Thou torturest me, Tubal. It was my turquoise. I had it of lair when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of honk. But Antonio is certainly undone. Mm, it's true. Yeah, true. Oh. Go to you, Fee me an officer. Bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. Oh. Were he out of Venice, I can make what merchandise I will. Go, good Dubal. Meet me at our synagogue. Go, 
good tuple. At our synagogue tuple. The bill. Yes, thank you. Got some money? And I'll bring you, I'll bring you to the chair. And I'll, I'll greet you just oh, behind the chair and sit you down. Yes, all right. What news from Genoa? Hast thou found my daughter? I often came where I did hear of her, hmm? but cannot find her. Why? There, 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 there! A diamond gone cost me two thousand ducats in Frankfurt. The curse never fell upon our nation till now. Oh. No, I never felt it till now. <laughs> Two thousand ducats in that and other precious, precious jewel. I would my daughter were dead at my foot and the jewels in her ear. Would she were hearsed at my foot and the ducats in her coffee. No news of them. Why so? And I know not what's spent in the search. Why so? Loss upon loss! The thief gone with so much and so much to find the thief. No satisfaction, no revenge, no ill luck stirring but what lights on my shoulders, no sighs but of my breathing, no tears but of my shedding. Yes, other men have ill luck too. <laughs> Antonio, as I heard in Genoa. What, what, what? Ill luck? Ill luck? Have an Argosy cast away coming from Tripoli. <gasps> I thank God. Is it true? Is it true? I spoke with some of the sailors who escaped the wreck. Oh, I thank thee, good pupil. Ah, good news, <laughs> good news. Heard in Genoa? Your daughter spent in Genoa, as I heard, one night. Four score ducats. Thou sticks the dagger in me. I shall never see my gold again. Four score ducats at a city? Four score ducats? There came divers of Antonio's creditors in my company to Venice who swear he cannot choose but break. I'm glad of it. <laughs> I am very glad of it. I'll plague him, I'll torture him, I am glad of it. One of them showed me a ring he had of your daughter, for a monkey. Oh, upon her, thou torturest me, Tubal. It was my turquoise. I had it of Leia when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. <laughs> but Antonio is certainly undone. Nay, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Fee me an officer. Bespeak him a fortnight before. I will have the heart of him if he forfeit. No, for were he out of Venice, I could make what merchandise I will. <laughs> Go, Tubal, and meet me at our synagogue. I... Go, good Tubal. 
at our synagogue, Cuba. Well, I think in that, too, we got diversity, but in the end, a likeness, because they both reached the decision about what they were going to do about Antonio at the same time. I think the only comment I'd make about that is that uh, the scene, in some ways, depends most of all upon Tubal, certainly from the point of view of how you interpret the play, because it's what Tubal thinks of Shylock that defines, if anything, for an audience, how the Jewish community look at Shylock. It seems to me that this scene is often weighted wrong if Tubal is a snivelling, sympathetic sidekick to Shylock. Mm. And that what both you as Tubal did then was to be at best dispassionate and detached and even in the end on the decision disapproving. And that's terribly important for how the balance of the play goes. I think we've got to or leap a bit now because we're running a bit out of time. So I think we should perhaps leave the little short scene when he meets Antonio and go on to the trial scene. And I think what we should look at in that, because it's what everybody remembers a Shylock by, is how do you make that final exit Mm -hmm. where the man of teeming word Shylock has virtually nothing to say? What do you do in that exit? Let's Mm -hmm. give our minds to that. It's, uh, It's always the great question for any actor playing Shylock, because again, Tradition. There are a whole series of stories yeah, about how yeah. actors have got off. I remember you saying to me quite early on in rehearsal, Patrick, how are you, how are you going to get off? <laughs> <laughs> and you said that I had to find a way, because every actor must have a way, and history has uh, uh, told us of some extraordinary ones. Uh, uh, Keane went through apparently a startling physical transformation at that moment. Um, Edwin Booth invented a detailed and elaborate mime, which went on for minutes in order to get himself off. And Irving, (laughs) Irving the master, again, was still and silent and moved to the door where he let out a long sigh as he left. And, of course, we have a a great modern version of it, too. Olivier's howl from somewhere way off in the corridors of the old Vic. It is extraordinary that Shakespeare provides nothing at the end, mm. isn't it? I mean, that's, right. that's what you have to fill out. Seems to me that finally, <clears throat> that at the end, um, Shylock, who is on top at the beginning of the trial scene, gets high, hysterically high, when he feels that for once there is someone on his side. This clerk arrives, stands beside him, and says, "Oh yes, you're right. Oh yes, it's for you. You should have it. I think you shouldn't do it, but nevertheless, you are in the right." Um, and he then loses his uh, sense of. Um, uh, what the others are doing. He loses sense of the clues that Portia's giving him about the blood uh, clause. And when finally the tables are turned on him by the Christians, uh, he is in danger of losing everything. It seemed to me then that if possession had been the dominant theme, that the only thing to do then was to get away with as much as you could. And therefore, for me, that meant humiliating myself and crawling. Should we? Uh... So Portia has pointed out to Shylock that he brought it upon himself because he asked for justice. And now we just look at the last part of the scene. Am I Duke, Portia, and Antonio? You're the Duke, you're Portia, and you're Antonio. Good, good. Spot the difference. That thou shalt see the difference of our spirit. I pardon thee thy life before thou ask it. For half thy wealth it is Antonio's. The other half comes to the general state, which humbleness may drive unto a fine. I, for the state, not for Antonio. Nay, take my life and all, pardon not that. You take my house when you do take the prop that sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. What mercy can you render him, Antonio? So please, my lord, the duke and all the court, to quit the fine for one half of his goods I am content, so he will let me have the other half in use to render it upon his death unto the gentleman that lately stole his daughter. Two things provided more, that for this favor he presently become a Christian, the other that he do record a gift here in the court of all he dies possessed unto his son Lorenzo and his daughter. Art thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say?
I am content. Talk, draw a deed of gift. I pray you give me leave to go from hence. I am not well. Send the deed after me, and I will sign it. Get thee gone, but do it. <clears throat> okay. Talk. No. Do we miss out something? I didn't notice it. No? No, no. I mean, do you. No. Right. All the bits. Three right. different characters. Dave. Three different characters. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thou shalt see this difference of our spirit. I pardon thee thy life before thou ask it. For half thy wealth it is Antonio's. The other half comes to the general state, which humbleness may drive unto a fine. I for the state, not for Antonio. Nay! Take my life and all! Pardon not that! You take my house when you do take the prop that doth sustain my house. You take my life when you do take the means whereby I live. What mercy can you render him, Antonio? So please, my lord, the duke and all the court, to quit the fine for one half of his goods, I am content. So he will let me have the other half in use to render it upon his death unto the gentleman that lately stole his daughter. Two things provided more. That for this favor he presently become a Christian. The other, that he do record a gift here in the court of all he dies possessed unto his son Lorenzo and his daughter. Art thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say? I am content. Clark, draw a deed of gift. I pray you, uh, uh, give me leave to go from hence. I am uh, uh, not well. Send the deed after me. And I will sign it. Get thee gone, but do it. <laughs> In christening, thou shalt have two godfathers. Had I been judged, thou should have had ten more to bring thee to the gallows, not the font. <laughs> well. Thank you both very, very much. Well, apart from the obvious moral that there's an infinite diversity in the way that different actors can play the same part, I would like to add a personal footnote to what you've just seen. What was my part as director in shaping these remarkable performances? Well, basically, I gave Patrick and David the same directions and made the same points both in detail and in general. Yet, as you've seen, the result was utterly different and individual. That was partly because the same point made to two different actors will always be transformed by their individual imaginations and personalities. I've often worked with two or more actors on the same part, and that always happens. Now, I say this to put into proportion a director's contribution to a performance. However much he may lead and prod in rehearsal, the end result will always belong rightly to the actors. That's one of the reasons why I always feel that though the conception of a production may be mine, the actual performance is something that in a deep sense no longer really belongs to me. Playing Shakespeare is rightly the domain of the actors. So though I may have strong views about how Shakespeare saw Shylock, these views were rightly transformed by Patrick and David. Their rich performances are therefore theirs, not mine. And that, I think, is how it should be.